Good morning, everybody. Thanks very much for coming. And I've put together a series of slides, 74 slides. They're each time for eight seconds each. So that clocks in about uh, 9.8 minutes. So uh, here we go. Uh, thanks, Jeannie, for the introduction. And I just recently moved about a year ago to NCSE. There is another NCSE a few blocks from here, National Council for Science Education. But uh, we have been studying the Earth's climate system since about the 1820s, when uh, Jean Fauré asked the question, why is the Earth warmer than it should be? He figured, based on his understanding of the inputs and outputs, that uh, Earth should be quite a bit cooler. And so John Tyndall, a generation later, was looking at the inputs, the shortwave incoming radiation from the sun and the outgoing long wave radiation from the Earth. He studied gases that might be trapping that long wave outgoing energy and wrote a paper about it in the 1870s. And his work set the stage for our understanding of what we call the greenhouse effect. Another generation after that, Svant or Ennius, uh, up in Sweden, uh, knew that burning fossil fuels, coal in particular, released carbonic acid, what we now call CO2, into the atmosphere. And he estimated that if we doubled the amount of CO2, it could lead to a four degree Celsius increase of the surface of the Earth. Fast forward 60 years to the International Geophysical Year, and we, although we, we remember that for Sputnik, uh, the National Academies here in the US put together a publication, a science education brochure called Planet Earth, The Mystery with 100,000 Clues. And in it, they talked about the natural greenhouse effect, the incoming short wave, the outgoing long wave, and the uh, heat trapping gases. And they talked about how human beings were modifying the climate by burning fossil fuels. And this is in science education materials from, from over 50 years ago. They're talking about the potential for melting of ice caps and, and the rising of sea level. There were others who were aware of this issue, and those include uh, some of the scientists working for ESSO, Humble Oil, which uh, over time morphed into ExxonMobil. And they were bragging about the fact in Life Magazine 1962 that each day they supplied enough energy to melt 7 million tons, which if you extrapolate that over 50 years is uh, billions and billions, as Carl Sagan might say, of uh, tons of ice. Of course, in the 19 60s and 70s, we were worried about other kinds of human modification of the Earth, including uh, thermonuclear uh, nuclear, uh, holocaust. Um, and Alan Robach at uh, Rutgers has estimated uh, that uh, even a modest exchange of weapons from Pakistan and India could le lead to very abrupt uh, cooling of the planet and change uh, agriculture as we know it. However, that, that uh, cooling may just be short, short term. So there's been a number of reports in the 70s and 80s. The Charney report uh, built on our, our Aeneas's uh, research. And over the past 50 years, the Earth has spun on its axis over 20,000 times. And during that period, we've also seen the population of the Earth more than double. Our fossil fuel consumption and the emissions resulting uh, more than increasing fivefold. And of course, that's also in, in influenced our GDP. It's been estimated that if we had to push a car 30 miles, the equivalent of a gallon of gas, that would be the equivalent of six months of hard labor. Uh, MIT just recently projected that at the rate we're going, we'll be hitting 1,200 parts per million of CO2 equivalent by 2100. And that could lead to an in increase of temperature of uh, up to four degrees uh, Celsius. So how has climate change been covered in, in science education? Well, the 1996 National Science Education Standards did not include human impacts on the climate system, and neither did the AAAS uh, literacy, Atlas of Science Literacy in the, in the 1990s. But that didn't stop the EPA from putting together a Global Warming for Kids website. And over the Bush, George W. Bush years, uh, there were some projects, Windows to the Universe. I was actually funded by NSF for the Climate Change Collection as a pilot project that eventually kind of evolved into the Clean Collection. Uh, but um, in, 19, in 2005, uh, Frank Niepold and I were at a conference in, in uh, St. Petersburg 
for Delisi, and we talked about uh, developing something similar to ocean literacy that was climate specific. And uh, that climate literacy document, which I think mo most of you are familiar with, came out in 2009, which was also when Congress approved funding to NSF, NASA, NOAA, and other organizations, other federal agencies for climate change education programs. And over a hundred of, the, of them have been funded. We'll hear more about them uh, later today. The Six Americas research, which I know a lot of you are very familiar with, has dug in a little bit to what people know, particularly young people, about uh, climate change. And they've learned that uh, when people know more, generally speaking, they're, they're more concerned about it. And they also are more likely to pass a test. But most teens and mo mostly, and most adults fail the basics of climate and energy. Uh, two thirds of students say they haven't learned much about climate change in school and only one in five feel like they've uh, got a solid knowledge of climate change. John Miller's uh, Generation X report also said that uh, the more people know, the more concerned they are, generally speaking. Uh, roundtable report from National Academy has indicated that uh, the topic of climate change often falls through the cracks, partly because there's a lot of other environmental challenges that we face, a lot of planetary boundaries. So other proposals like the National Geographic's uh, Geoliteracy initiative have focused on kind of broader themes of, of uh, uh, geoliteracy. The uh, campaign for environmental literacy that Jim Elder is a part of has been promoting the concept of uh, the environmental literacy ladder. And these are all really important efforts and they really do dovetail with climate and energy literacy. Uh, Louise Huffman at uh, University of Nebraska put together the environmental literacy framework which, uh, with a focus on climate change. And of course, we'll hear more about the next generation science standards today, which uh, are being finalized. Uh, 26 states are involved with that process. And energy is a cross-cutting theme. And from what, we, what we've seen so far, climate and global change writ large are really well taught uh, throughout the standards there. Uh, there is broad support for the idea of national s science standards. And uh, again, we'll hear more about that. Um, but there is a lot of silence, as Mike alluded to, about uh, climate change, and that extends into the classroom. And, and one, of the, one of the reasons for that, obviously, is that uh, climate change, to be blunt, is, is a bummer. And uh, if you talk about it, sometimes you're accused of being an, an alarmist. Uh, how do we handle the kind of the psychological, emotional dimension of dealing with the, the gloom and doom of climate change is, is uh, very challenging, and certainly it plays out on the political stage as well. Uh, and um, also, we, we have to be clear that there are vested interests, including for many years, Exxon, who uh, funded organizations like the Heartland Institute to pr propagate uh, m uh, manufactured doubt, and, and that helped delay any kind of adult conversation about climate change. At NCSE, we talk a lot about uh, the three pillars of denial. And in a nutshell, those pillars are that the science is bad, the implications on society are bad, and therefore we need equal time. We, the alternative view, uh, need uh, to put forth our ideas, in this case through DVDs like Unstoppable Solar Cycles or the Great Global Warming Swindle, which uh, they'll send around to classrooms uh, saying that if you're teaching about Al Gore's ideas, you need to also teach this alternative. The sociology community also talks about denial in terms of literal denial, interpretive denial, or implicatory denial, denying the implications. And perhaps uh, denying the implications is the most common form of denial that we're wrestling with. This is an ad for diesel jeans about uh, global warming ready clothes. They have a whole clo clo clothing line uh, preparing for global warming. So we know what works, and we'll talk more about that this morning, but um, I'm getting to the age where I start giving young people advice about uh, the future, and uh, to whether it's newlyweds or kids that are still in school, I would certainly encourage them all to be climate literate uh, and to at least know the basics of, of, of the climate system and how humans are modifying the climate system. Uh, they should uh, understand the basics of the greenhouse effect. Uh, Michael Rainey at UC Berkeley has found, he did a survey in San Diego that found zero out of 280 people, including script, some script scientists, really could describe the greenhouse effect. Obviously, energy literacy is vital as well. And we need to look at the international dimension as well, in, in, in addition. Uh, 
Alison Anderson at the uh, Brookings Institute uh, has put together a nice white paper about that. We're very excited to be working with the UC Berkeley Museum of Paleontology. They have a website called Understanding Science and Understanding Evolution. And through funding from the Moore Foundation, we're now working on a website called Understanding Global Change that uh, we're just starting to develop. But uh, the National Center for Science Education, uh, we will continue to address denial, doubt, and delay, and, and uh, dismay. Uh, we'll help identify and remove barriers where we can, where it's appropriate for us to try to help out. We do feel it's important that we have a national climate or global change education survey to find out where climate and related topics are being taught, if at all. And uh, certainly I'd encourage all of you and uh, young people everywhere to visit our website. Uh, and uh, that uh, concludes my nine minute and 47 second uh, overview of uh, climate history. Thanks.